Welcome to Nationwide on the network service of the NTA. I am Lydia Odije Ochi with the news. Federal Executive Council has approved automation of custom services. The Federal Executive Council has ratified President Muhammadu Buhari's anticipatory approval for the Nigeria Custom Service Modernization Project. The public-private partnership project expected to gulp $3.1 billion comprises complete automation of the service for enhanced revenue generation and economic growth. Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning Zainab Ahmed announced this while briefing journalists after the meeting of the Federal Executive Council said, however, that the ambitious project will be fully executed at no cost to the federal government. This is an end-to-end -end automation of all of Nigerian custom service processes. And it's going to bring huge value to the country. So this investment of 3.1 billion US dollars is broken down into capital investment of 1.2 million US dollars that will be done in three phases over 36 months by these investors. And the 1.8 million US dollars is a projection of the operational cost over the 20-year period of the implementation of this project. This project has the potential to yield up to 176 billion US dollars of revenue for the project. And the consortia that are providing these investments are going to be paid over time according to a schedule that is negotiated for their investments, including their profit and cost of funds. So this is the best possible way for Nigeria to be able to roll out very important capital projects using funds from the private sector and providing service for the use of uh, the Nigerian people and the government. In another development, the presidency has formally reacted to what it described as utter falsehood and disgraceful lies. The media report claiming that Sadiki Abba, President Buhari's aide, is COVID-19 positive. In a statement, the senior special assistant to the president on media and publicity, Gariba Shehu, says the report is sheer fabrication and brazen effort by the online news medium called Digital Newspaper to mislead the public. The presidency therefore wishes to advise the general public to ignore such stories that are intended to mislead the people and create unnecessary anxiety about the safety of the president. The statement explains that upon the directive of doctors, all staff working for and around the president are routinely and rigorously checked for the virus under the supervision of the chief of staff, Professor Ibrahim Gambari. The senior special assistant to the president on social affairs and domestic matters, Sadiki Abba, always tested negative for COVID-19. President Muhammad Buhari has expressed deep concern over the heavy flooding that destroyed farmlands, farm produce, houses, and other personal belongings in parts of Kebi State. The president described the incident as a setback to the nation's efforts at boosting local rice production as part of measures to stop food importation. He noted that Kebi State is the focal point of the federal government policy to produce rice locally as part of this administration's commitment to agricultural revival, which suffered relative neglect in the past. President Buhari noted that the bad news couldn't have come at a worse time for our farmers and other Nigerians who looked forward to a bumper harvest this year in order to reduce the current astronomical rise in the cost of food items in the markets. While sympathizing with the bereaved families and farmers affected by the devastating floods, the president promised to work closely with the Kebisid government in order 
to bring relief to the victims. Remedial work has commenced on the damaged portion of the Rigachukun Bridge along Kaduna Zaria Highway. Abdullahi Mohammed is standing by for a live update. Abdullahi, if you can hear me closely, what is going on? Give us an update on the bridge. Hear me clearly. I would like to let you understand uh, what is going on here on uh, the uh, bridge here. Uh, if you uh, see exactly what is happening uh, behind me, uh, you see that uh, work has uh, commenced. Uh, it's an indication of the, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, uh, this morning we came and found out that uh, machines, men are already on ground uh, working. But I would like to uh, let you understand that uh, there, there's a lot of technicalities involved in this uh, remediation, and that is why we have uh, here standing by the uh, 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 federal controller uh, uh, who is in charge here in Kaduna, who will explain to us exactly what is going on and the kind of work that they are uh, uh, doing here. Uh, uh, Mr. Right, thank you for joining us. Please, thank you. I would like you to, to tell us exactly the kind of work that is going on here. Well, as you can see, we have kept our promise. We promise to start as soon as possible. This morning we came and then we had to evacuate what was there. This bridge was built 60 years ago, and what they <coughs> did at that time cannot uh, be useful for now in terms of the materials and design concepts. We have to uh, remove all the materials and be mindful of the traffic volume. When it was built some time ago, we didn't visit the kind of vehicle. Now we have about 24,000 vehicles per day passing on this stretch. And this uh, south northbound from the south is the one that is overstretched because you have heavy vehicular traffic moving on this axis. So what we did is to use boulders. We have to put instead of lattice material. This one also is environmentally friendly because if it rains with materials like laterite to disrupt the work. So we have to use boulders to fill up the place with some uh, aggregates and then we are going to build it up to our soil base. You see now we are putting all these uh, materials to cover the boulders we are put in place so that it will cover it and it will strengthen it. What we have here will last much more than the bridge because the bridge also lasts 100 years. If after 60 years it is strong, the what we are putting here will last longer. It is within what we call the transition slab. So once it's climbing, it will be very strong and it will transit to the bridge effectively. Considering uh, the fact that people are, are facing difficulty passing the other lane, they would like to understand uh, when exactly this place will be open for traffic. In the next two days, we should be able to finish this work. If the weather is friendly, by tomorrow, Friday, should be working. But if it's not friendly, later start to do. We are going to work we to ensure that even earlier than what I'm saying, the work is completed. You can see that the schedule is working as, as God, the weather is friendly. So hopefully, we will finish on time. What guarantee also will you give us? Oh, the guarantee, like I told you, if you see what we're doing here, if you compare to what was there before, there's a big difference. You can see boulders, chippings, and what have you. These are aggregates that are very strong. They can carry any kind of load. So we are very, very certain of what we are doing. And what we are doing is sustainable and it will last long. Thank you very much uh, for coming on uh, to, uh, to talk to us this afternoon. We are really grateful. And again, uh, I know the public will also like uh, to uh, understand uh, the volume of traffic going on here and the, the, the the people managing uh, this traffic. And that is why still I have with me the sector commander here in Kaduna, Half is Mohamed Taroni, who is also going to explain to us the uh, kind of uh, critical role the road safety has played so far in ensuring that traffic flow uh, as, as, as it should here on this road. Uh, tell us exactly what your men has been doing here to ensure that traffic flow is uh, uh, at least not difficult for motorists. Uh, uh, yes, what we actually plan to do and we're doing it to ensure that the traffic is flowing in just two lanes. That means the lane coming out of Kaduna and the one going into Kaduna are maintained. This is achieved through <laughs> arbitrary designing, whereby we have deployed our men to, to line the route so that people do not form extra lanes. Forming extra lanes causes congestion and gridlock, and everywhere becomes chaotic. So we've been able to achieve that, and we've been able to time the peak periods of traffic. Usually it's between 8 to 10 in the morning, or 11, and then from 5 p.m. up to 8 p.m. So at these periods, we reinforce our manpower deployment so that it can, we can adequately manage the situation. At least how many men have you been able to put down here to do, those, to do that kind of work? On a daily basis, we deploy as many as 30 to 40 personnel 
to do this job and when the situation becomes very critical, sometimes we invite the Kaduna State Traffic Management Agency, Castlea, to give us a helping hand so that together we can make it better. Thank you very much for coming to talk to us. All right, um, Pleasure, thank you. Uh, Lydia, thank you very much. Uh, you know I've taken much of your time, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Abdullahi, for that uh, situation report from Riga Chikun Bridge. Thank you so much. Moving on now. 32 years after its reconstruction, the Ada Ibadio Road again is to be reconstructed by the Boiga Oyetola administration. The governor at the flag of said the road project will be completed within three months in view of its economic potentials for the state in areas of agriculture and tourism. Joshua Ogunjide reports. The first construction of the Ada Ibadio Road project was executed under the old Western Nigeria by the then Premier, late Obafemi Awolowo, in the mid-50s and was subsequently reconstructed in 1988 under the military regime in the old Oyo state. The road is central to the tourism and hospitality potentials of Osho state as it stretches to Ibadjo, the old battlefield of the Great Kuriji War, while flagging off the 13.15 kilometer construction and rehabilitation project. Governor Abu Egoitala believes that when there is good road network, economic development will be easily attained as investment delivery becomes certain. Our administration has carried out 28 road intervention efforts across the three senatorial districts in line with the quality, equitable, and adequate service project delivery of our development agenda in less than two years in office. We shall continue to embark on this road intervention program as an anchor to delivery of prosperity the project under alternative project funding approach, APFA, will cost about 1.5 billion naira when completed in the next three months. The road will open up the agrarian towns of Ibajo and Hada for economic prosperity and infrastructural development. From Ibajo, Shun State, Joshua Ogunjide, NT News. Road accident claims two lives in Lagos. Details of this and more with Hingino in Lagos. Thank you, Lydia. The fatal accident that claimed two lives on the Bagada Expressway in Lagos Tuesday night have been attributed to recklessness on the part of the drivers. Amakao, who visited the scene, reports that the incident resulted in a gridlock on the expressway. That was the mood along Bagada Expressway Tuesday night. According to an eyewitness account, four vehicles were involved in the unfortunate accident. I hear bah. So this uh, uh, three mark, fell break from that side. Now he he drove and uh, hit at the back of uh, the downfall to the tipper. They squeezed the the motor. That was what happened here yesterday. Yeah, for them to take that alcoholic substance is not good, but. They, they, I don't know why they keep on doing it. Mostly, even the last mile people, if they try to stop them, to caution them, it will be as if maybe they are fighting them. As at the time of this report, the damaged vehicles have been cleared off the road. However, officers of the State Road Transport Management Authority, Lasmara, are having a tough time controlling traffic, which is an aftermath of a crash. The remains of the two women who lost their lives on the spot at the scene of their accident have been deposited at the mortuary, while the six injured passengers are now recuperating in a nearby hospital. In Lagos, Amaka O. NT News. Talking aviation now, the Lagos state government has expressed its readiness to support the Federal Airports Authority of Nigeria towards the reopening of the nation's airspace for international flights on the 5th of September. Governor Baba Jidesonwolu stated this when he received the management of FAN on a courtesy visit led by the managing director, Captain Rabiu Hami Suyadudu, at the Lagos State Government House, Ikeja. Nosa Osla reports. Nigeria's international airports have been shut down since the 23rd of March to all but essential international flights as part of the country's efforts to contain the spread of the coronavirus pandemic. Lagos State's Governor Babajide Sonwulu 
who commended the efforts of the federal government to contain the spread of the virus, assured the management of FAN of the state's government's commitment to creating an enabling environment. It's been a difficult time. COVID has ravaged all of us in the last six months, and I'm sure that your industry has been worst hit. But as a nation, you know, we have been able to make the best, and um, we're indeed happy that um, we're seeing a reduction in the positivity of COVID, and so we're excited that from September the 5th, at least some degree of commercial activity will begin to happen you know, at two of our international airports. The effort of the federal government in constructing a brand new international terminal through the China Exim Bank loan facility to ensure better service delivery and security and safety is also commendable. Federal Airport Authority of Nigeria is a service organization statutorily charged to manage all commercial airports in Nigeria and provide service to both passenger and cargo airlines. In Lagos, Nosa, Osula, NTA News. We now take a break. The news continues after that with Nura Tonko Wakili in Sokwatu. <laughs> Back. News continues in Sokoto. Sokoto State Government has pledged sustained support to the activities of the National Boundary Adjustment Commission in the state. The State Deputy Governor Manir Mohammed Danya, who doubled as the Chairman State Boundary Adjustment Committee, made the disclosure while hosting officials of the Commission on a courtesy visit at his office. Dalat Abdullahi reports. In Sakuta State, Nigeria shares border with Tawa region of Niger Republic for a distance of about 97 kilometers from Bachaka in the local government to Dantika village along the east Azurumi border. The distance of about 11 kilometers between strong pillars along the border is too wide, making it difficult for border communities and the security operatives of the two sister nations to clearly figure out the imaginary border line to avoid encroachment and improve border security. The National and International Boundary Commissions decided to create intermediate pillars of 50 meters distance between the strong boundary pillars. Officials of the commissions, including that of Niger Republic, planted 46 intermediate pillars between strong pillars 48 to 49 from Rungma Warjao in Araba district of Elela local government to Tofal Baba village in Gada local government. And this marks we had primary pillars that were demarcated earlier. These was our intermediary pillars between the primary pillars. At times we have villages, neighboring villages. They do have problems with security agencies either from here, our country, Nigeria, or from our, the Niger counterpart. All right? So by now coming to put more pillars in between those primary pillars that were there, so it shows a clear boundary. A similar projects have been completed along all other states sharing border with Niger Republic. Officials are expected back to complete same along Sokoto border with Niger Republic. In Sokoto, Dalat Abdullahi, NTA News. Farmers in Silami and Benji local government areas are counting losses as flood has submerged farm produce worth millions of naira. This is coming as the National Emergency Management Agency held an assessment visit to the, to the two areas. Abdurrahman Osmanjibrila has the report. The assessment visit by the National Emergency Management Agency officials to the two areas also had technical officials from the Sokoto State Emergency Management Agency. Many hectares of farmlands with crops worth millions of naira have been submerged by flood. The recent disaster in the two areas which are dominated by farmers is a threat to food security with the affected victims calling for quick government intervention. You have seen many land destroyed and the many houses destroyed by a flood. They have beans, millet, beans, guinea corn, and rice and other crops. And uh, before the, the, this uh, episode, uh, farmers are coming here with uh, very uh, happiness, seeing that what their crops are doing. But very unfortunately, within these three weeks, we, we, we can see for ourselves there is nothing to be left. 
the technical teams from the federal and state emergency agencies restated commitment to providing quick relief to alleviate the conditions of the affected people. We are going to uh, write uh, forward the comprehensive record of this to our headquarters in Abuja for relief assistance. The flood disaster in Sokoto State has affected about 12 local government areas, rendering many homeless. In Sokoto, Abraham Swanjibrila, NTA News. And that is it from here. Nationwide continues with Lydia in Abuja. We now continue with NCDC update. Nigeria's Center for Disease Control has confirmed 239 new cases of COVID-19 in 15 states of the Federation as at 1st September 2020. A breakdown of the figures show that Plateau State still has the highest confirmed cases of 116, followed by the FCT with 33. Then Lagos with 19 cases, Ekiti has 12, Kaduna and Ogun states have 11 cases each. Others are Ebony State with eight, Benue seven, Abia and Delta recorded five cases each, while Ondo State has four, Edo State with three new cases, Imo and Oshun both have two new cases, and Bauchi State has one case. So far, Nigeria has 54,247 confirmed cases of COVID-19, out of which 42,010 patients were discharged, while 1,000 and 23 have died of the virus. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control, NCDC, has continued to advocate need for states to take ownership and sustain the activities of their emergency operation centers by creating independent budget for their operations. This came to the fore again at a capacity-threatening seminar for Aquaibom State frontline responders drawn from various ministries, departments, and agencies. Ifoma Aikoji has details. Lessons learned from Ebola and other outbreaks. The NCDC, under the leadership of Dr. Chikwenye Kwazu, had initiated the establishment of public health emergency centers across Nigeria. To further strengthen the effectiveness and efficiency of such emergency operation center in Akwaibom State, the NCDC has begun a capacity strengthening program on fundamentals of emergency response management to coordinate the actions of key stakeholders in support of the incident management activities. By so doing, our knowledge and capacity have been improved, so we are going to be able to work better. The synergy that will be achieved will go a long way to mitigate the problem of COVID-19 in Aquaibom states. The training according to the head of emergency operations division, NCDC, Dr. Evaristo Senyako, is to develop participants' capabilities to put up incident management system structure with a clear knowledge of their key roles and how to develop sustainable emergency operation plans even before any outbreak. The target, he says, is to build a frontline team that can swiftly respond to any epidemic within 120 minutes. So we develop different SOPs, even business continuity plans, to ensure that the EOC runs after establishment. A 10-day long program has the support of a Kwabom state government in Uyo, Ifoma Aihoji, NTN News. The Nigerian Medical Association in Cross River State is protesting the incessant abduction of its members, especially the recent kidnap of one doctor, Vivian Otu, who is yet to be released by her abductor, abductors. The doctors walked through major streets in Calabar to the Cross River State House of Assembly to register their plight while demanding for legislations that will sanction perpetrators. Maureen Liu Ajum reports. Placards with inscriptions such as Free Dr. Vivian Otu unconditionally, Make Cross River State Free Again, and Stop Kidnapping in Cross River State, among others. The doctors say enough is enough. They lamented how doctors save lives on a daily basis to only be paid back with a traumatic life in the hands of kidnappers, which sometimes results in the death of most members. What is hindering the state governor from assenting this bill because there's no
no state legislation against kidnapping. We are making the state governments, every arm of government, the legislature, the judiciary, to rise up to their responsibilities. The Cross River State lawmakers who bemoaned the spread of kidnapping in Cross River State promised to work together with the relevant agencies of government for the implementation of the bill against kidnapping, which the speaker, Ethan Williams, says has been passed and assented to by the Cross River State governor. If you kidnap and the person dies, it's death sentence. If you kidnap or you are a party to it, it's life imprisonment. We want to see it happen. Dr. Vivian Otu, a pediatrician, was kidnapped on Saturday, 29th August 2020, and doctors in Calabar have embarked on an indefinite strike to demand her release. In Calabar, Maureen Leo Ajon, NTA News. Enugu keys into World Bank assisted COVID 19 economy recovery stimulus. Details with Chinenye in our Enugu Network Center. Hello, Chinenye. Hello, Lydia. Thank you for joining us in Enugu. Over 500 million naira has been approved by the Enugu State Government as first tranche of the COVID-19 Action Recovery Economic Stimulus Program, CARES, a World Bank-assisted intervention designed to help states recover from the economic effects of the COVID-19. The Enugu State team of the CARES program was at the government house for a meeting on implementation strategies on the two intervention areas. Susan Eze has the details. The World Bank Development Intervention Program focuses on two strategic areas, agriculture and micro, small and medium enterprises, MSMEs, to improve on the livelihood of families and the economies of states. With the approval of 500 million Naira first tranche for the program implementation in Enugu State, about 57 million Naira out of this is mapped out for inputs for farmers in the agri sector. The state is concentrating on its areas of comparative advantage, rice and cassava. Leading the Enugu State team, the State Commissioner for Finance, Mrs. Ada Oyaune, after a meeting with the State Deputy Governor, Cecilia Ezilo, explained that though the team has collated full data of registered farmers in the state, individual farmers are also eligible. All we are saying to individuals of Enugu State who are farmers but not incorporative is to register in their local government. It doesn't matter if you're in any cluster group or not. As an individual, you register with your local government um, agriculture officer in each of your local government because what the team is going to do is to start a drive. As the team is set to embark on sensitization of the populace on the program, the target for the micro, small, and medium enterprises sector is job creation as a value chain. In Enugu, Susan Eze, NTA News. The Director General, Voice of Nigeria, and a frontline chieftain of the All Progressive Congress, Osita Okechuku, says there is need to stop the undue interference and control of local government councils and allow it to provide development of the grassroots in the interest of all. He was speaking at the end of a hearing on the matter between Philip Eze of the APC and Lawrence Ezoko of the PDP in Enugu State. Amichi Pius reports. Local government council is an arm of government that has witnessed overriding influence by governors of some states of the federation over the years. Most people have argued that these governors have demonstrated control over the resources of officials of these local government councils. A development Osita Okechuku frowns at, adding that these have stifled the growth of projects at the grassroots level, making life difficult for rural dwellers. In the 1999 constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria explicitly states that the local councils shall be democratically elected. And at each turn, we do not know any state of the federation where the local council was democratically elected under free and fair election. And we're urging that we must continue the mission to recover our local councils that have been hijacked by our governors across the board. The candidate of the All Progressive Congress Party at the concluded councillorship polls in Enugu State, Philip Eze, is challenging the victory of his PDP counterpart. Petitioner alleged that the election was marred by electoral malpractices. 
the results in the remaining seven polling units should be preserved. That was as the court. And then the two result, uh, elections reconducted in the two polling units of Ole and Okwanda so that the final winner can emerge. At the end of hearing, the tribunal adjourned the matter for judgment on the 14th of September 2020 in Enugu and the Chief Hires in TA News. And that is it from Enugu. Nationwide continues with Obey here in Benin after this commercial break. Do stay. <laughs> And here is Benin's contribution to Nationwide. The Edo governorship election is less than three weeks away and political parties are mopping up campaigns, activities in the various wards in the three senatorial district. Here is an update of the campaign activities of the APC and the PDP. <laughs> The former national chairman of the APC, Adam Sushomali, the running mate to the APC candidate, Malam Gani Aoudou, and other leaders kicked off the campaign visit to Akpana Ward 10. All of you who have PBC, without PBC, you are stronger than any governor. Everybody will vote. The vote will count. The message of all the other party leaders is that the joint ticket of Pastor Sagi Ize Yamu and Malam Gani Aoudou will move the state forward. The moment you vote for Gani Aoudou and Pastor Sagi Ize Yamu, more development will come to Ayoguri and also Apasho. Is that not what you want? New members were received into the APC at Akpana Ward 10 and Ayoguri Ward 12. In Okwila, the people drew the attention of the APC candidate to the bad roads which the APC candidate, Pastor Sagi Izeyamu, reacted to. So the partnership we are going to have is a partnership that we develop Okwila. In Isako Central, the APC train wooed the people of Ogbona, Fuga, Udaba and Anegbete. The governorship candidate of the APC, Pastor Sagi Ize Yamu, has called off his rally at Usain following a road crash. Meanwhile, the PDP candidate and members of his campaign team have taken their campaigns to communities in Nuriyomo local government area to seek the people's support. A former governor of Anambra State, Peter Ubi, and governor of Delta State, Ifan Yokoa, attest to the development strides of Governor Basaki and wants the people to re-elect him. Everybody is proud of your governor. Yeah. That is why we're here. What he said is real. In Wode, the PDP candidate urged the electorate to re-elect him to consolidate on his development strides. I know the problem. The problem is the young road. Road is important, but empowerment and economy is more. Governor Basaki was earlier with the Enogi of Eho, His Royal Highness, David Gehon. The two main governorship candidates in the Edo governorship election are sheathing their swords and asking their supporters to do the same to ensure a peaceful election on the 19th. This is the affirmation they made before the Oba of Benin, who is bringing them together to forge peace. Gochukuka Ona reports. <laughs> Before this event, the political environment in Edo State has been unfriendly, creating apparent tension. But from what we are seeing, those unfriendly acts seem to be history. We want to thank you for the parallel road that has continued to play. I pray that God of us, who has pursued this choice, will give you very many, many more days. Other stakeholders are also getting on the same page. I share your, your, your concerns and I assure you to the extent that I can speak, we will speak to the Edo people and to our supporters and even non supporters to abide by your legacy. I believe it is in the interest 
of all of us and the good people of this state who will take peace before, during, and after the elections. I'm completely relieved of what your majesty has had to say on the kind of responses that we are getting from the principal actors. This pact of peace is at the instance of the Benin monarch who is passionate about seeing a peaceful governorship election in Edo State. I want to beg you, I want to plead to what I want to hear from both, both parties. From today, you have visited us, you want to assure me, one we are We work together with Pastor Israel together, not different. Because you, you are, you are the believes with this, peace has come to the political space in the state. In Benin, Ogochkuka Ona, NTA News. And that's it from Benin. Nationwide continues with Lydia in Abuja. Many thanks, Obehi. Nigeria is on the chart of flood-prone destinations in the world with approximately 100 deaths and devastating consequences on property and animal lives as impending danger continues to loom in the predicted 2020 flood alert. This imminent disaster shaped stakeholders' views on NTA's current affairs program Tuesday Live in finding deliberate measures and enforcing necessary frameworks to avert the avoidable disaster. Abubakar Usman Akwanga has more. It's one of the global environmental crises, especially in coastal areas with global warming factored as one of the leading causes. In Nigeria, saturated nature of wetlands make more than 30 out of the 36 states vulnerable to flooding. Guests on Tuesday Live reassessed the chances of Nigeria surviving the threatening disaster and proffered elaborate solutions. This must be collaborated. A is capital intensive. Secondly, it, uh, it, it has, sometimes it even has international dimension because the river Niger, for example, comes from Guinea through Mali, through Niamey. It has been progressing as we, as, as we predicted, or quite unfortunately, because some remedial measures you know, steps are not taken by relevant authorities. Global intervention funds, internal control measures, and standard sanitation practices are some of the management systems suggested to curb the disaster. So there's a lot of ecological damages from erosion in a lot of states. In fact, all the states of Nigeria I cannot pick out anyone that is exempt from that. So ecological funds will help in all of those kinds of things at the state level. And also the World Bank Erosion Control Project has elements that could be helpful in this regard. States should not be in a position to provide the necessary support, technical and material, to the local government so that the local government can now be on their own. Even without direct involvement of the state, the local government can handle uh, flood management issues. Other secondary effects of the challenge, stakeholders say, are outbreak of diseases, washing away of farmlands, and the mass displacement of persons. Nigeria's rising flood profile is one of the natural phenomena that requires desperate attitudinal change and regular enforcement of corrective measures to mitigate the narrative that has now assumed a dimension of monumental proportion. In Abuja, Abu Wakar Usman Akwanga, NTA News. Thank you, Abu Wakar. The National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies, NILDS, is ever ready to reach out to all legislative arms of government and democratic institutions in the area of capacity building for the overall interest of good governance. Director General of the Institute, Professor Abubakar Suleiman, gave this assurance when the chairman and members of the Benue State House of Assembly Service Commission visited the Institute. John Yaku has details. This is to seek collaboration with the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies to advance the capacity of personnel and top management of the Commission towards optimum service delivery of the State Assembly. This is also to develop a training program for the newly inaugurated Commission to enable it hit the ground running. It is our father belief that cooperation 
between our commission and the institute will greatly enhance the legislative output of our staff. The quality of bills, the quality of law, the dynamics of oversight, the quality of representation is informed by the quality of the service. If we don't get the right people to work with them, we shouldn't expect the right policies or bills or law emanating from the house. The institute assures that it is aware of the COVID-19 protocol and will not do anything to compromise it in its training programs. In Abuja, John Yauku, NTA News. The world over, geospatial information has been identified as a tool that provides good governance and development in achieving the SDGs. This is what stakeholders want to be imbibed in Nigeria at the 2020 Virtual Survey Coordination Conference and meeting of the Advisory Board on Survey Training put together by the Office of the Surveyor General of the Federation. Haman Jamani has more. Geopartial information is a tool to track, monitor, analyze, and manage any occurrence that has a location or temporary element, as well as forecast models and analyze potential consequences from policy and events. It provides the integrative platform for all digital data that has a location dimension, and it has been established that without geopartial information, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals will not be realized. The United Nations Global Geopartial Information Management Initiative established is to create a formal geopartial information coordination mechanism which maintains that the four criteria for good governance are planning, geopartial information, finance and capacity development and this is what stakeholders here are advocating in Nigeria. Our responsibility is to provide requisite geospatial information for all government activities. These are the responsibilities. And then what we are actually doing now again is that we are going to some agencies, we are going to government agencies, we are interfacing with them. They say good governance, which is an evidence-based decision making, is a requisite geopartial product. Communique is expected at the end of the three-day conference, which has the team geopartial information, achievement of SDGs and good governance. Hamman Germany. NTA News. Science laboratory equipment and mathematics training kits worth 90 million naira procured by Ondo State Government has been distributed to over 64 public secondary schools in the state. Governor Oluwa Rotimi Akeredolu, while distributing the equipment to representatives of the school, said the project is designed to encourage effective teaching and learning of science and mathematics in the state. Abiola Rio reports. Some science subjects like physics, chemistry, biology, and mathematics are among subjects which most students find difficult to assimilate. To some students, it is due to practicals attached to it which most public schools cannot afford equipment to use in teaching. Oluwarotimi Akimolai students of Ilimobola Girls High School, Jorge says, the science equipment will make teaching and learning easier for her. It's where for education. I just want to thank the governor for giving us this treatment. The essential science equipment, including dynamic trolley set, photometer, graph boards, and gas cylinders, were distributed to 64 public secondary schools spread across the 18 local government areas up to state by the state governor, Uluwarotimi Akeredolu. We want to provide functional education and I believe that towards this end our administration will leave no stone on turn. This will also enhance the student performance in mathematics and science subjects in external examinations and competitions. The state government says more schools are to be covered in the next phase of the exercise in Akure, Abiola, Rio. NCA News. 
Our next report from MENA says Niger State government has reaffirmed its determination to find lasting solution to the prevailing challenges posed by the Almajiris in the state. Governor Abubakar Sani Bello stated this when he flagged off the comprehensive model integrated Quranic education in MENA in a bid to reorganize the more than 3,000 Quranic schools spread across the state. Suleiman Kodogi reports. The program is designed for learners to complete the memorization of the glorious Quran in six years within which period they are expected to acquire formal basic education in addition to vocational skills. The comprehensive modern integrated Quranic center is expected to take off immediately after self-reopening of schools with the registration and the enrollment of fresh learners in each of the Emirates in Niger State as a pilot program. Inaugurating the center, Governor Abu Bakr Sani Bello noted that the second phase of the program will allow for private participation with laid down rules and regulations. When a child grows up on the street at the age of four, nobody to provide him what to eat or where to sleep or what to wear, that child will grow up just like any successful human being. The program consultant, Sheikh Ibrahim Dai Rubauchi, described the initiative as a welcome development that will change the narrative for the better. We have over 3,000 Almari schools in Niger State. However, we are beginning with eight mega schools in various locations in the state. High point of the event was the inspection of the facilities in Mina, Suleiman Kodogi, NTA News. And from Makudi, the Benue Taraba Joint Peace Committee has submitted its report to Governor Samuel Utom with a call for the establishment of a Joint Crisis Conflict Resolution Standing Committee to tackle communal crisis menace. Charles Abba has that report. The persistent inter-ethnic crisis between communities in Benue and Taraba states and the need to foster enduring peace between them led to the establishment of a joint peace committee with five members from both states. Chairman of the Benue State Committee, Daniel Abagu, stated that from their findings, the violence between the Jukun and Tif coexisting in Benue and Taraba states has numerous remote and immediate causes, among which are disputes over land, traditional leadership, political authority, fears of domination, and others. The committee recommended, among other things, that governors of both states should undertake a tour of affected areas with members of the Joint Peace Committee to build confidence in the people, accept and implement citizenship status to all warring communities in Taraba and Benue states. There were more than 26 outstanding agreements, especially the 10-point agenda that was put in place by the federal government in 1991 and 1992. We want to say that if that 10-point agenda only implemented, this crisis will stop. Uh, if there are any other thing that we can do to promote peace with our neighbors in Taraba, we will definitely do that. In Makudi, Charles Abba, NTA News. Sports is next. Rehabilitation work begins on the main ball pitch of the Mushud Abiola National Stadium as Anthony Joshua labels fight with Kubrat Pulev in banana skin. Details with Bade Adele on Sports Update. <laughs> 